Hello, my name is Nora Atkinson, and I'm the Fleur and Charles Bressler Curator in Charge of the Smithsonian American Art Museum's Renwick Gallery. And I'm delighted to welcome you to today's conversation between Emily Zilber and Lauren Fensterstock, who's one of the four honored artists in this year's Renwick Invitational 2020 Forces of Nature. The Renwick Invitational is an ongoing series which seeks to highlight the work of emerging and mid-career artists in the craft field deserving of broader national attention. It's supported through the endow a generous endowment from the Cohen Family Foundation, and this year additional support has been provided by the Carolyn Small Alper Exhibitions Fund, Ed and Kathy Fries, Carrie J. Fries, Ban and Cecily Hudson, the James Renwick Alliance, the Chlorfine Foundation, Riza Leviso Moray, Eleanor Rosenfeld, Myron Harold Weiss, and the Tokushima Prefecture. For each edition of the Invitational, we bring together a panel of experts to select the artist and the theme. And this year, I was joined on the panel by Emily Zilber, Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Wharton Estrick House, and Stefano Catalani, Director of Gage Academy in Seattle, Washington. And I am deeply thankful for, to Emily for agreeing to be our guest curator for this Invitational for her insightful essay in the catalog on Lauren's work, which I encourage you to pick up if you enjoy the program today, uh, and for taking part in this conversation. Lauren Fensterstock is an artist that I have been hoping to work with for years. She's actually a jeweler by training who's become known for her seductive large-scale installations investigating the garden, which draw on decorative arts traditions like quilled and cut paper, mosaic and shell work. And with this site-specific installation, uh, she has really outdone herself. Uh, the totality of time lusters the dusk is an incredible feast for the eyes, expanding her vocabulary beyond the garden uh, to take inspiration from the 16th century manuscript, The Book of Miracles, which I am sure she will tell you more about in just a moment. Uh, of course, none of us could have anticipated that we would be working on this show um, as we were entering into a pandemic. And this work is really one that's hard to fully comprehend without seeing it in person. So today's program really is a special opportunity to go inside the galleries with Emily and Lauren and see the work in all its glory. And I do hope that you'll be able to come back and see the work in person when the Renwick reopens. Uh, finally, this program is one of several that we're producing in conjunction with Forces of Nature, um, and these programs have been generously sponsored by the Smithsonian Women's Committee. So if you enjoy this conversation today, please visit our website to find other virtual programs uh, that are either already posted or upcoming with the other Renwick Invitational artists, Roland Ricketts, Deborah Moore, and Timothy Horn. And thank you again for being here and for all your support. And then without further ado, I will turn it over to Emily and Lauren. Hi, Lauren. I'm so happy to be here with you today talking about um, the totality of time, Lusters, the Dusk, your amazing piece that you did for the Renwick Invitational 2020. Um, can you give us a little introduction to the piece, how it came about, and uh, what you were thinking about when you made it? Yeah, oh, hi, Emily. It's so exciting <laughs> to be here and to see you. And I'm, I'm excited to see the piece, which you know, I spent a year making, but I have, because I live in Maine, I haven't seen the piece for seven months. So it's exciting to, not seven months, but many months. So it's exciting to be back and see the piece. Live. Right, you were here for installation in August and September of, um, of 2020, and this is your first time back now. Um, it's, it, it must be interesting to be coming back to this after such a long time away. Yeah, it's exciting to see the piece um, with fresh eyes and, and to sort of think through the process. Um, but just to, just to go back through the development of the piece, um, as you know, you first contacted me in late spring, early summer of 2019, mm -hmm. um, when I was uh, completing a fellowship in Athens, Georgia. And so my process to getting to the piece started there, took me home to Maine, um, and you know, developed over many months. Um, while I was in Georgia, I was doing a lot of research into causality, and that was a question that guided a lot of my work, um, thinking about how is causality present in a landscape. And it led me to think about things like weather, astronomical events, 
um, and other instances where um, we see things impacting each other in a landscape. Um, and I started looking at these 16th century texts of weather and cosmic events. Um, and that was really the jumping off point to the comet and the clouds and some of the other features in this piece. Absolutely. And of course, landscape is not something that you came to first with this piece. That's a longer running um, theme and idea in, in your practice. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, landscape and gardens are something that fascinate me. Um, and I am a gardener. I love um, you know, spending time in nature. But I'm much more interested um, not in observing nature like a plain air painter might, but looking at how nature served as a metaphor in poetry and philosophy and painting um, as a way that we project human experience um, into the landscape. So uh, most of my work, I'm not uh, working from direct observation of the landscape, but thinking about how the landscape functions as an allegory. Sure, and thinking about how the landscape gets mediated through different forms of making, like the Book of Miracles, like these, these fabulous images that you've introduced us to, um, which, which really resonate in this remarkable piece that has such a tremendous impact. Um, the comet above, the land below, you've given us something that sort of unites land and sky, and that is a new direction for you. This is, um, you know, when we've talked about it before, you've talked about it a little bit as a transitional piece, as something that's been allowing you to explore some new themes and ideas. And so I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about where you see the work sort of fitting in, you know, your artistic practice, your artistic career. Yeah, it's really, it is this interesting transitional piece for me, um, formally, materially, and conceptually. Um, so some of the elements on the ground, the, the paper grass, the plexiglass ponds, the sort of black earth, um, those are features that have um, come up in my work quite frequently over the last decade. Um, where the mosaic is very new. This is the first piece I've ever shown in glass mosaic, and I, we could talk about that later. Um, but also these sort of elements of the sky are new. And it's interesting to me because um, they're both elements of nature. They're both things that impact our bodies on a very mm -hmm. real daily basis, minute by minute. Um, but where the landscape elements on the ground are things that we know, like I know what it is to touch a pond or to run my hand through grass, the comet, the clouds, the rain, um, they're things that are more abstract to us, even though they're real, like we primarily see them through representations, through abstractions. I'll never know what it is to like touch a comet or even to, to really see it with my own eyes. Um, so it's, for me, a shift from like manipulable objects to non-manipulable objects. Mm, mm. Um, it's, it's the impact of the thing rather than the thing itself, because that will always be sort of inaccessible to us. And, and so when you're thinking about taking something that really is best known through representation and bringing it on this really massive scale, um, because this piece takes up the length of an entire gallery <laughs> at the Renwick. Um, you know, it was designed for this space, designed to be in conversation with the architecture here. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you bring some of those representations into three dimensions and, and specifically into the context of the Renwick here? Yeah, um, well, as you mentioned, the piece was created for this space specifically. So I started with floor plans of the room um, and then designed something that I thought would be effective in this space. And then developing the individual forms, the book that you mentioned, the Book of Wonders, um, is a 16th century German text that um, chronicles 
all of these incredible weather events, starting with events described in the Bible and then going up to the mid 16th century when the book was produced. And so that was an important visual reference. So the comet itself was based on a specific or you know, between a few different images from that book. I think there was a comet um, that went over Constantinople um, in maybe the 11th century, I can't remember exactly, but this mm -hmm. most closely resembles from that book. Mm -hmm. um, and that book had these incredible descriptions of the events themselves, but then also um, these kind of like allegories of what the events wrought. So I think that comet came and then all the crops died. And there was another comet described in that book um, that once it appeared, the German king died a few days later. Um, and so I love those kind of pretentious descriptions of those events. Yeah, that, that interest in sort of ascribing causality to something as um, uncontrollable as, as weather. And I think you get a sense of that, um, that onslaught, that sort of lack of control when you come in and you're faced with um, the piece itself here in the gallery. You walk right in and the comet is the first thing you see. It's between these two columns. And so you have this element this sort of otherworldly element bursting through between these points of order. And I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about how you hoped people would experience the piece as they came into the gallery and then as they really were able to engage with it um, in full, because this is a piece that you can indeed walk around completely. Yeah. This is such a beautiful and dramatic room, but it's kind of a tricky room as an artist because it's quite narrow and very long. Um, and to me, the room has a very cinematic uh, impact. I felt like you would never be able to see the entire piece um, from one vantage point or even at one time. And so <clears throat> I wanted to make a piece that would sort of unfold as you moved through the space. Um, and I wanted to kind of have an opening moment that was a little bit aggressive mm -hmm. so that if you're entering um, from the main entrance to the room, that comment is like, projecting out at you. Um, but then as you walk around, you might discover the sequence of um, you know, other small moments, like the rain, the clouds. Um, and to me, it, you know, it speaks to the sense of time unfolding. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I love about comets is that their arc encircles um, not only a huge um, array of space, but also time and their mm -hmm. markers and um, their existence is made up of these many moments. And, and to me, that's an important metaphor. Sure, the time is happening um, both in the moment that we're in, but it collapses time and has these relics of all of these different periods or different moments. I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about that concept of time and how it relates to the title of the piece. Yeah, so the title of the piece is The Totality of Time Lusters the Dusk. And I should acknowledge that that title was a collaboration with the poet Anne Riesenberg, who's a dear friend of mine. And um, we spent a lot of time talking about the piece and trading words. And so um, <laughs> that was sort of, we birthed that title together. Um, yeah, I mean, time is something I think about quite a bit. Um, and as someone who makes also very laborious objects, um, you know, I was saying it was interesting coming here today, having not seen the piece for so much time, um, because my experience of the piece isn't this finished work and this form. It is, you know, um, beginning, like I remember last December, beginning the substructures and the audible book I was reading at that time. And, you know, kind of month by month, these different moments of working on the piece and how you know, it evolved through all of these moments, um, you know, and then this particular moment will end. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think we think of objects as this kind of like the static form, but they're really these events, you know, where objects change and you know, they sort of live and die. Um, and so, yeah, so the time for me, you know, is very much about my experience of making it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, time unfolds um, as you're walking around the piece, in addition to the sort of time that's embodied in all of these objects, when you talk about labor. Um, 
the materiality of this work, I think, really attests to that, to yeah. that time spent, <laughs> especially now that you've, um, you know, you're, you're known for these really time-intensive, laborious modes of making, whether it's paper quilling and cutting or now mosaic. Can you talk a little bit about how the material choices in this piece, um, how you thought about them in relationship to everything we've been talking about? Yeah, I'm cursed because I trained as a jeweler, yes. and so I think about <laughs> things on this tiny, detailed scale, and I'll agonize over, you know, a centimeter. But I like making really large things, so <laughs> it, it ends up being <laughs> a challenge. Um, so definitely, some of these materials are just materials that come from my training as a jeweler. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also tend to pick things that I feel have a kind of agency, like charcoal, like crystals, obsidian. Um, they're, they're materials that have a deep symbolic history, but they're also things that I think impact our bodies. Mm. Um, and I am interested in the way that um, when you pack an object with ornament, with material, with, you know, a year, hours every day of labor. Mm. Um, to me, that has a kind of power. Um, you know, it's like, I've never seen a surface I didn't want to fill. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and sometimes, like, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll make like a dense, a dense surface and maybe leave like an area of mirror. There's like the area where some, there's potential for something to happen or there's um, a space for the unknown. Yeah. But to me, there's a power in, um, it's like a fully charged battery. You know, mm -hmm. the objects I think retain all of those hours of my labor, all of the energy that goes into it. Um, and, and I think they have, you know, a force of their own in that it's, way. It's, it's a little <laughs> bit of a different take on that sort of notion of fear of empty spaces, right? The horror vacuum. <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's coming from a different yeah. perspective, but yeah. <laughs> I think it might lead you to similar, yeah. similar results. Um, you know, it's interesting to have this incredible um, material quality to your work, this kind of intensity of labor, intensity of, of time and effort, the changeability that comes because so many of the objects that you make have multiple small parts and so really you know the way they catch the light it changes from moment to moment stance to stance um, and yet you are known <laughs> for working in monochromatic black and so one of the things I think the materials do in your work in your work this material choice when you have it in this color palette, very limited color palette, is that it really does draw attention to those material qualities. And I'm curious if you can talk about the choice of monochromatic black. I know that's a long-standing interest in, in your work, um, and I know it's one that's, that's deep and multifaceted. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the black just draws you in. You know, I mean, partly, like, I grew up in the 80s. I was into goth, like, all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's something about black that it's, um, for me, it's very calming. Mm. Um, I think it has a history associated with ritual, um, with the unknown, um, that to me, um, I find it a very inspiring color. And it isn't a color that we associate with nature unless we're thinking no, about, yeah. you know, like the night sky, um, dark places, caves. Um, so there's a little bit of a sense of mystery with that color that mm. I find very also inspiring. Um, but there's something about just optically. Um, I love with most of my work when you walk in a space, it's just, it's almost like there's nothing there. There's a void. And then you slowly realize that there are all these thousands of parts. Mm -hmm. And as your eyes adjust, um, you discover more. And so I feel like it's a color that demands that your body move to it mm. to see what it can reveal. That question of, of, of sort of re revelation or revealing is also interesting when I, when I think about it in the context of your 
um, some of your specific references to things like the Claude glass. Right. And so I'm curious if you can explain the Claude yeah, glass and, yeah. and, and how it plays into your work, because it is, again, something that has this dark quality to it, but it is associated with the landscape, which is not our common conception. There are, two, there are really two black mirrors mm -hmm. that have inspired my work. Um, one is the Claude glass, which was um, a handheld convex mirror allegedly um, created by Claude Lorraine, the famous landscape painter, um, which is why they, they name it the Claude Glass. Um, but it was a device that painters would use um, to capture landscape, and it was convex, so it would create a perspectival landscape, mm -hmm. um, which made for making a composition easy. Um, and I love this idea of observing the world, not painting from life, but painting through this lens. Mm. Um, they also, as sort of garden craze happened in Europe, um, people would carry these lenses through their, in their pockets and use them to find scenery in the landscape. And to me, it's also like a precursor of the iPhone, where you're carrying this lens that we see the world through. Um, you know, rather than with our own eyes. And then the other black mirror that has inspired me is the, the scrying mirror, mm -hmm. um, which is a mirror used for divination. There was a famous one that um, John Dee had that I believe was carved um, obsidian, brought back from the New World, and he used it to like help Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, um, you know, divine the future of England. Um, and like in ancient Babylonia, they would use um, black oil mm. and scry from, from the reflective surface of black oil. And so for me, you know, those two mirrors, one is about, you know, sort of visually observing and one is about observing and projecting into the unknown. Mm. And I think that's interesting, not just in these sort of smaller reflective black surfaces that are, are part of the mosaic pieces, but in these large, beautiful black ponds that, that sort of dot the surface of, of the landscape. They provide these moments of, of a sort of uninterrupted, clear, clean surface, which is so in contrast to everything else that's here. And when you're in the gallery, you can really see reflections of the piece itself, in itself, which I think is, is really, really beautiful. Yeah. Those, those mirrors for me are important. Um, you know, partly they are, it's, it's, I was saying like, sometimes I'll leave a little space untouched. Right. <laughs> but, um, you know, I feel like the mirrors provide a, a moment of relief mm. from all of the ornament. Um, and, and they also provide an upside down world, mm -hmm. you know, and a space to see yourself. So, um, yeah, they, and, and potentially something unknown. They have that sense of like sinking beyond, beyond the room that we're in. Mm. Yeah. I think that, that makes a little, an interesting segue to some of the sort of con other conceptual things that were on your mind when you were making the piece. I know um, notions of um, environment, environmental challenges and concern, um, questions around uh, ideas of apocalypse were very much on your mind <laughs> as you were making this piece. Um, and then certainly, uh, you know, making the piece within the context of the start of, of the pandemic and then um, having the life of the piece from September until we've come back to see it again um, in February, you know, unfold amidst <laughs> a really challenging time um, and one in which nature has, has seemed very unwieldy. I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about um, some of those themes and ideas. Yeah, I mean, I, um, again, I, you know, I made the piece, you know, in, it began in 2019 and I made it over most of 2020. And it was a really tumultuous period. And um, you know, it came after a few years that I had felt a lot of political anxiety, mm -hmm. um, both just about sort of the direction of our country and the world and um, how that ties to the environment. Um, and so, um, yeah, it was so interesting. I mean, with COVID coming on, um, it really felt like um, 
it was the sort of evidence of everything I had been worrying about. Mm. Um, and it was so interesting how much the comet ended up looking like the COVID. It's, <laughs> it's <molecule>. uncanny. <laughs> So, you know, it's interesting because that, you know, I was saying how like I, I experienced the piece in these moments and in March of 2020, I was working on that, like the comet part of the piece and I was reading Amitav Ghosh's book, um, The Great Derangement, mm -hmm. which looks at how um, humans have lost the ability to imagine huge disasters because our literature is so... Um, function on sort of modern ideas of the everyday and the singular man. We've lost this kind of collective vision. And then in the midst of these two things, COVID struck. And I remember having this moment in my studio looking at this object thinking like, here it is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and it is interesting because, you know, so much of these portents like comets and storms, um, which serve as this metaphor where we project our anxiety. Um, I see that as a kind of abstraction, but you know, I got through COVID so far <laughs> working on this piece. I mean, I had this singular purpose to make this object mm. and emotionally that saved me, you know, every day. I can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> and at the same, you know, it's 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 this it's this purpose, right? And at the same time, you're making this object, not knowing if it will open, when it will open, not knowing that it would be open for just a short amount of time before yeah. it closed back down, not knowing that we would have virtual events yeah. <laughs> for everything. Um, and so, you know, I, the idea of having a purpose and and that purpose pushing you into an unknown space um, must have been an interesting place to, to create from. Absolutely, and I've been so, I mean, I, it's because of COVID restrictions, the show mm -hmm. was temporarily closed. Yes. And, um, it, you know, I have to say, like, I loved the idea of the piece just hovering here. Mm. Um, because so many of the sort of anxieties and fears that we have about you know, our environment are human-centered. Mm -hmm. You know, like cl climate change is partly a problem because we want the planet to be hospitable to humans, right. you know? And um, to me, this comet speaks to something beyond the, the lifespan, beyond the space of humans. Mm. Um, and so there's something about it just hovering here alone, you know, and, and through the, you know, through some major political events, like the inauguration, the events of January 6th, um, that this object just persisted. And certainly I think the proximity of the yeah. Renwick Gallery yeah. to the sort of seat of government, um, to uh, our leaders, <laughs> to <laughs> a lot of the folks who are shaping yeah. um, the way that the last year unfolded can't have escaped you <laughs> and you're thinking about this. No, I mean, you know, one thing I didn't mention about black is that it also is a color associated with mourning mm -hmm. and, and some grief. Um, and the comet itself, I mean, it is, it's kind of a juggernaut. Like it, it, it has that feeling of a, wreck or a wrecking ball mm. um, that is either bringing destruction, um, the result of destruction that's around us, um, but somehow, um, you know, it's, it's hitting the fan when that's coming through. Well, I also, what the, com the comet, as it's depicted in the Book of Miracles, is um, it's over Constantinople and it's um, uh, sort of sharing the news of Muhammad's birth, right? right. And so as much as it's a, a portent of destruction, there's also the idea of new beginnings yes. on the other side of yeah. the comet as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. With destruction, there's always birth. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think you can see both of those. Yeah. Yeah. qualities in, in this work. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the comet. I'm curious if we can talk some about the rain um, and the clouds and how you see the juxtaposition of sort of the central comet that comes and strikes you right when you walk into the gallery with the sort of rain as it unfolds towards, um, towards the back of the piece. Yeah, I mean, the comet, um, 
as we were saying earlier, it's, it's something that we understand more abstractly mm -hmm. and I think speaks to a bigger arc of time. And so that's kind of that opening moment. But as you move back and find the clouds, I do think it's a more intimate moment. It's something um, that we understand um, more with our bodies. Um, it speaks to a shorter time frame, like a, a storm moves in, it moves out. Mm -hmm. Um, and so to me, you know, it, it's sort of in the back, like you arrive at something um, a little more immediate there. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting physically because it's the one part of the piece that um, I imagined, but I didn't <laughs> see it until I got here. You know, everything else I was sort of setting up in the studio and um, the rain, I planned it. Um, we have those beautiful I, drawings depicting it that you made. <laughs> I had drawings. I kind of like taped some up in uh -huh. the studio, but I never saw the rain until I, I came here. And it was the very, very last thing I did on the very last day of installation. Um, so the rain is still a little bit, a little bit miraculous and surprising to me <laughs> um, because I haven't spent a lot of time with it. Well, hopefully, hopefully you'll get a chance to while, yeah. we're, while we're here today. <laughs> into it a little more deeply. Yeah. I'm curious how, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about how the meaning of the piece changed over the course of the time that you were making it, and then um, coming back to the piece after this time away. I'm curious if we can talk a little bit more about um, what's changed during that time, and, and, and maybe even where it's leading you in your work right now. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I feel like I'm still processing it. And mm -hmm. even just saying today, like, you know, I, we, we just walked into this room a few minutes yeah. ago. And um, I really, when I began the piece, I mean, I really um, felt a lot of anxiety, first politically, mm -hmm. um, and then as the piece progressed and, and COVID came on personally. Um, and, and, and I see those two things as intertwined. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure what it means right now. I mean, it's still unfolding, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I, I feel like seeing it today, I felt a real sense of relief. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was a little nervous to see it again after not seeing it for a few months. And, you know, when I was installing it, I had been so close to it. Like, this was the thing I had looked at, you know, 14 hours a day for 10 months. Um, fabricating it and to come back and just see it as a complete object mm -hmm. um, that I was a little more removed from. I felt a sense of personal relief, mm -hmm. um, but I, I feel like I was also able to see like the rain come down, like maybe the storm is breaking a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like in this moment I'm trying to see the potential for a little hope. I think I think that's, that sounds like a welcome sounds like a welcome message a welcome yeah. a welcome change of events. Yeah. And you've still been you've been making new work the whole um, the whole time that that since the piece has been installed. And and I'm curious what elements of what you've learned or what you've um, really become excited by or invested in in making the piece for the Renwick you're carrying through to this new body of work. I know you have a big exhibition that you're yeah. working towards. Yeah. So. Um, well, uh, I'm still, um, as I mentioned, this was the first mosaic piece mm -hmm. that I've shown publicly, and I'm really loving mosaic. Um, and so, and it's sort of a mosaic in quotes, I'm sure uh, people who are really professional or sort of traditional mosaics, I don't know if they would consider it mosaic. And can I ask It's mosaic related <laughs> and mosaic adjacent. <laughs> And, and can you sort of tell us what first brought you to Mosaic? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I have been making a lot of work. All of my work tends to be cumulative, like thousands of parts, like mm -hmm. from the cut paper, mm -hmm. um, and then more recently, shell working. Mm -hmm. um, and, and both the cut paper and shell working are practices that I associate with like ladies' accomplishments. Mm -hmm. They were the kind of crafts that young women did in the parlor that never make it to like the, the canon of art history. Um, but I think those materials and processes are culturally important. Mm -hmm. um, but as I was working with the shells on a, an increasingly larger scale overall, but the shells got smaller and smaller, <laughs> um, 
I realized how similar the shell working was to a mosaic. Mm. And so that led me to, to think about the actual materials of mosaic. Mm. And as I mentioned, I had spent this year in Georgia. Yes. I was away from the ocean, so my shell <laughs> access was limited. Um, so I'm moving ahead with the mosaics, and I'm shockingly making a few pieces right now that are like dark gray. <laughs> I've moved into like sort of hematite. I'm flirting with some <laughs> antique mirror that you know. So um, things are getting things are getting a little brighter. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. So there's still a lot of darkness, but there's a little bit of light appearing in the work. Mm. Um, and I'm continuing to think about nature as a metaphor, and I've been looking at. Um, different eschatologies, which are histories of the end of the world. Um, and, um, you know, I do Ashtanga yoga, I meditate daily, and I've spent a lot of time reading um, like yoga sutras and um, kind of, I'm going to say flirting with Buddhism, um, which t I'll come back to, but um, there's an amazing. Um, lecture that the Buddha gave about these seven suns appearing in the sky one by one um, and each having an impact on our planet but when they all seven appear it just like desiccates the earth mm. um, and so right now I'm making making these seven suns which maybe is a little bit of destruction to make room for I don't know rebirth or something new yeah, it's a lo it's there. It, it, there's a lot of <laughs> loaded iconography that goes along yeah. with the suns, but certainly yeah. that the, the seven suns story is one that has a lot of interesting content and and potential. I mean, I think it's interesting in hearing you talk about what's coming next. Books, reading, philosophy—it's yeah. so important to you and your work, and I know it's been this touchstone for you. Um, Every time I talk to you, <laughs> you're deep in a, a yeah. new sort of fantastic book, or or um, uh, have a new sort of concept that you've that you've recently you know begun integrating into your work because you are such an avid reader. And I'm curious if you can talk about um, you know some of the some of the nonfiction literature poetry that that really has stayed with you and continues to inspire your work. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Right now, I'm reading a lot of Buddhist texts. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, I went through um, a year, as I mentioned, I was reading about causality, and I was reading yes. a lot of um, like object-oriented ontology writers like um, Timothy Morton, and um, thinkers who are moving from ontology to causality. So moving from thinking about the nature of being as like a series of isolated objects or mm. isolated people um, moving to how interdependent everything is. Mm. And, and that to me, again, it's like moving from understanding a landscape as just a static site to understanding how a landscape is this unfolding event that is um, this interrelation of human, animal, cosmic mm -hmm. activity over millennia. Um, and so, yeah, so I've been going back and forth right now through some um, sort of Western philosophy, but realizing how um, sort of Buddhist notions of interdependent co-arising are describing the same thing, but with like a lot less words. <laughs> 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 um, and, and to me, you know, all of these um, ideas about interdependence, mm. I mean, COVID ties in and, you know, I think a lot of sort of like American ideas about individualism, mm -hmm. that kind of mythology of the individual is really harmful um, and at the root of a lot of our political and environmental problems. So, um, you know, to me, th these sort of philosophies offer potentially a, a healing way forward, yeah. a connected way forward. Uh, one that centers yeah. the collective yeah. and <laughs> <laughs> requires people to actually engage with each other in, in a way that demonstrates care, which I think is, um, you know, in some ways that, that notion of demonstrating care is really 
central central to your work in a lot of different a lot of different ways. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, it's in, it, like it's something I can understand intellectually. It's mm -hmm. harder to embody. Um, and you know, meditation is one way, and, and making I think is this other way, um, in which uh, working on a large project, seeing again like how things unfold through stages and collaborations with others, like everything and everyone that had to come together for this piece to happen, mm -hmm. um, but also just the day to day of like trying to cut a piece of glass and make it fit, you know, and and sort of understanding the world and my body mm -hmm. through its interaction with things. I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about what you hope visitors sort of feel, how you hope they engage with, with your work when, when they come into this space, um, when they come see the piece, again, in the con context of the Invitational, which is really about these four very unique and different interpretations of sort of how nature can enable conversation, can have this kind of power. I'm curious, um, yeah, if you have any thoughts about about the visitor experience when they come into the gallery. I'm like, I haven't seen humans in I know, so long. It's like, I know, like, yeah. all, all, all hypotheticals. <laughs> like, I don't know how to like, order a coffee anymore from a human. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I feel like, I, you know, I always say like my work is something, it's not about something. And so I don't know that there's like one singular message I want to convey, but I hope to open a space that I think has a level of just complexity and drama and literal and metaphoric reflection to, to give people a space to maybe ask questions, to be a little overwhelmed, um, and you know, just a, a space for reflection, mm -hmm. I think, um, which hopefully maybe they can then take take outside. I don't know. Absolutely, uh -huh. and it certainly will will stay with them <laughs> <laughs> once I, they leave the gallery. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think a, a, you know a, a space for a little bit of mourning, like a, mm -hmm. a space that um, you know where it's okay for the rain to come down. It's okay for things maybe not to be okay, um, and to find a, a kind of a beauty in that when you can, when you can step away mm. a little bit. It's, it's a sort of collective mourning object Indeed. in a lot of ways. Yeah. We, we think about this history of, of personal mourning objects, of mourning jewelry, um, not necessarily something that the people engage with so much anymore, but the idea of having an object can be both for collective mourning and collective sort of hoping <laughs> um, uh, is, is a really power, powerful one, I think. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about sort of showing in the context of the Renwick, which is, of course, the, the Smithsonian American Art Museum's home for, for craft? Um, what does it mean to you to, to, to show work in this context? Well, I mean, it's so exciting, and it's um, a space that, you know, I've come over decades and learned from and loved, you know, just going back to when I was a student to now. Um, so it's certainly an honor to have my work here and also to be amongst such great artists in, in the whole show. Um, and, you know, to have, um, because I didn't show extant pieces, to have the support to make something that um, truly was a challenge to me, um, and then to make it in this time, um, I felt like it, the piece does speak to so much of, of what's happening, what we are sharing collectively, uh, and to have it here at the Smithsonian, which I see as a museum of us, you know, as, as a country, as a community, um, it, it, it was inspiring to me. I think your work also sort of treads these, these blurry boundaries that we often ascribe to craft, especially contemporary craft, you know, whether it's sculpture, installation, um, 
do you think about your work through any one of those lenses in particular, or are they all sort of useful at different at different moments? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I, I don't have the distance to think about myself through yeah. labels, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes in the middle of the night. Um, but, you know, I definitely, um, I have an interdisciplinary practice, but it's definitely informed by the crafts, and, and I do, um, associate myself with the history of the decorative arts, you know, materially, formally. Um, I feel like for some artists that lineage is really important and um, they're really focused on a material mm -hmm. um, or a sort of a field um, and that propels the work. Um, it's never how I've operated. Um, and to me, in some ways, the opposite of that, I always feel like um, I'm so invested in history, but I don't want to be bound by it. Mm -hmm. Like history is my teacher, but it's not my master, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and so I'm kind of a thief. Like I, I, you know, take from like garden design, sculpture installation, jewelry, and mix it all together. I mean, uh, craft is, is this form of making, form of thinking that we so commonly associate with the stuff of everyday life. And it seems to me like you're picking and, and drawing inspiration from the ways of making and the objects that surround us. And so I think, it, I think it, there's so much there in dialogue. Um, I love that you're the, the <laughs> <laughs> your te teacher, not your master. Yes. <laughs> But I think, I mean, what I do share specifically with craft is materiality mm -hmm. um, in that, again, I always feel like my work primarily is something. It's not about something. Mm -hmm. um, and that it's form and materials, the experience of those is, is primary to me beyond mm -hmm. any kind of narrative that we develop around it. Mm -hmm. So. I'm curious if you have sort of favorite parts of the piece. If there's parts of the work that you like, <laughs> that you that you feel like um, you know really allowed you to to really invest yourself and 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 grow. Um, uh, it's it's a little bit of an unfair question, I realize asking. <laughs> Well, to talk about. I, my immediate thought is like, I can't say it out loud because they'll get mad. <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, the grass is like the oldest friend because yeah. it's um, the one piece of the exhibit that um, I had before. Like, it, it, I repurposed that. And that particular grass is interesting because it has been to Holland. It's been to... Uh, Poland, it's been to Wisconsin, and so that grass has sort of moved around and had many lives. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, the, in some ways that's like my metronome, <laughs> like, <laughs> like that's come along. Um, but I have, and the rain for me is, is also, it's, it's surprising and it's very unlike anything else I've mm -hmm. ever made. And mm -hmm. so I feel like I'm still learning about what's possible with that element. Mm. Um, but I have to say, the comet, the, the front part of the comet, was probably the most challenging and the most fun part to make. Mm. <laughs> I remember getting in-process pictures yeah. from you. And, uh... <laughs> like on the spikes, there are these navettes, which are these sort of pointed ovals. And I, I think there's maybe 4,000 of them, but they were pointed on the back, and so I had to grind every single one of those by hand. <laughs> and of course, uh, you're working with this yeah. kind of magical black grout that has this real um, sort of depth and intensity yeah. to it. Uh, there yeah, were it's... many grout samples. <laughs> I had like maybe three months of grout samples to, to get there. I, I, I don't doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> Are there things that, that we haven't touched on that you want people to know about this piece? I don't know. I mean, I'm so, I'm, I feel like I'm still so excited for people to see it, you know, um, and to see how, you know, how that changes the work. Mm -hmm. um, so in some ways, um, my, you know, I have more questions than answers mm. in this moment. Mm. 
um, which is exciting. It's not a bad yeah. place to be. Yeah. That's not a bad place to be, especially as you're sort of embarking on, on some new things. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Lauren. It's been such a pleasure to, to talk with you today. And um, you have been a vital part of, of this exhibition. And um, we're so excited to, to share this piece here with, with the world. Thank you. And thank you, Emily, for including me in the show and for all of your support through developing the piece, making the piece. You know, it was my pleasure. Everything. And to everyone <laughs> at the Runwick um, for being so welcoming and supportive. Absolutely. So. Thank you so much. Thank you.